darkness was so intense that you needed the light of God to rescue you. Well, today's interview on Healing Rain is about Corolla, who was groomed as an eight-year-old girl. And at 13, she was human trafficked, sexually exploited, and economically exploited. And as she tells her story 24 years later, you're going to see how the light of God can break through darkness and how the healing love of God can heal every pain. Well, today I have Corolla with me on Healing Rain. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for the invitation. I'm honored to be there and it since the moment I met you, I feel like the love and the spirit of your presence. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well, and I'm thankful for Rosie who introduced us and she has been a friend for many years. And, and really part of your story is that you were groomed from the age of eight years old and then you were human trafficked at the age of 13. And there's so many people that don't understand this process. So what was it like for you to be groomed as an eight-year-old? Yes, um, my traffickers are a couple of, fame, of a very, very famous singer here in Mexico and her musical producer. So especially the producer that was older than her, um, had a very uh, legitimate image in the industry and international awards, the support of TV stations, radio, everything. And this singer had a very um, exotic way to present herself. But when you saw her in private in person, the character she would play was very introverted. Uh, she was always talking about God or like saying things like, oh yeah, if God wants and things like that. And saying that she wouldn't have a boyfriend, that her career was the most important. And that she always pictures herself as a very good friend to anyone. So I was very young and I, I happened to be there in a gathering uh, with my sisters, older sisters, and they spotted me. I was very, very young, very young to realize anything. But what I can say is that she always seemed super friendly, like an older sister. She she saw herself as a sister. She said, I have a sister your age, which is true. <laughs> and she said, oh, I want to protect you. I want to take care of you. You're so sweet. So everything about it was like really, really uh, easy to trust. Then they, uh, the, the producer, the man, was like not even having any suspicious attitude, not even having conversations with any female or anything. He was like back anywhere, not, I mean, not even looking at you. So that made everybody feel a little bit comfortable with the situation because in human trafficking is the only crime uh, that 42 percent of the criminals of the traffickers are women okay independently that about 90 wow. percent victims are women 42 percent of the traffickers are women because that's a way they can really take advantage of you. Maybe a singer, a friend, the mother of, of a pimp or a pimp herself, okay? So it is important in human trafficking to understand that there has to be a bond, a connection. As a little percentage of the trafficking cases is a kidnap. They just abduct the victim and then they exploit it. But Initially, most of the cases could be a, a relationship like in Mexico and many other countries, the boyfriend trafficker 
it also in the States, it's very common. The boyfriend that starts to ask a favor. So there are certain stages. The grooming is the stage when, where they establish their trust. They establish a, a fantastic trust. It's almost too good to be true. And my grooming took five years. So persistent. Mm. There are five years in a row, they came to my house. They they didn't do anything risky. Everything was perfect. Everything was they were almost as part of the family. So five years, we have to understand that the traffickers are methodic. It's not a like a uh, unexpected crime that just happens like that. It's a process. In, in most of the cases, it's a big process. And the process of the grooming, I mean, my grooming was very long, but normally takes months at least because you have to establish the trust the bonding the relationship and then they have to start doing the coercion i mean at some point they in my case is like oh you're so young you need training i'm gonna help you i'm gonna take care of you i would go to their um to their academy take dancing, singing lessons, acting lessons. Oh, you're good, but not so good. So they they make you want to be better, to do better because they're helping you and you have this opportunity. So it's like a, a circle that it's already spinning. And it's the same in most of the cases of abuse. I mean, you just want to do better and they start to ask more and more and more and more until you're just there for you five years of time they've been in your home a part of your family they've been grooming you they're wanting to move you forward when did it switch over to being coercion and what was that like when it began to be uh considered by the law to be human trafficking so dis <laughs> Describe that because you're right. It's it's a very systematic process. 13 years old is a, a very good age for traffickers to, to capture kids, right? So the thing is, is that I had suddenly this great um, opportunity because they were going to make a soap opera in the main TV station. And there was gonna be about, it was gonna be based on her life and she was gonna have herself and her best friends as children having back and forward in the story. So it was gonna take maximum one year of my life to do this show, right? So they said, this is the great, great opportunity. First, they talked to my parents. Then my parents asked me if I wanted to. Then I said, yes, everything seems so good. My, my parents said, set some conditions. They made an agreement, like not to be alone. I mean, the visits, the working schedule, the school, everything, right? So I finally went. Uh, I skipped one year. I, uh, we talked to the school that I was going to skip one year of school there, but I was going to come back. Everything looked perfect. So when I when I first left uh, with them, things started to to be different because I started to see like um, that I was always with this singer and not with the trusted people that was around me. So she was always with me. She was always with me, and then she became ah you're my best friend and things like that. That I was. 13 years old and she was probably almost 30. So at that age, <laughs> you don't have like twice your eyes, twice your age friends, right? So it was like, why is she such a close friend? So she was always with me. And then this role was a certain thing. And then somebody else like was basically my age entered to the, to the scenario competing for my same role and I was like but we already even signed a document no but I want you to have it but she she's um 
she's uh, flirting with the producer and, and maybe that's going to be a difference. And I'm like, well, we're, we're not here for flirting. We're here for my talent or whatever you said. So she started to talk about inappropriate things like sex or that my parents or my family gave me values to keep me trapped into a little life instead of having great expectations for me, that my society was like the same, not, not wanting me to be different, that I had to, to step up for my dreams, that if I really wanted something, I had to dream for it. And pushing and pushing and pushing for these ideas that actually turn into her wanting me to, to, to have sexual intercourse with these men in order to get the, the role. So I said, no. Then she said that because he loved me, I said, no, I don't love. I, I, I mean, I barely had a boyfriend. I was 13 years old. And nothing really worked until one day she, in the middle of the night, she took me out of my room and literally pushed me into his room. And that was like the first rape, okay? That is not human trafficking as we consider, but yes, because I was taken out of my house from one city to another with the objective of having um, a sexual... Uh, intercourse maybe it was not in exchange of money but she took me in exchange of whatever creepy thing they had in their mind so when i said i don't want this i want to leave they said oh then you're just an easy woman with very different words and who's gonna want you in your house after what you did and you just did it because you're not in love so uh, they use your own principles, everything they gather about what are your principles against you. So I was like, mm, into trapped into things. And then he began to be nice and this and that. And I didn't know how to react. I was a, a, away from my trust people. And um, then, uh, we established a relationship. Obviously, I was 13 and he was, I don't know, 40 or something and disgusting and horrible and nobody ever would like to have a relationship with that man. But suddenly they forced me to say that I wanted to do it. So if I said, no, I don't want to do it, they were like, you lied. If I said, I want to leave, then you just use it. So everything I would say, it was going to be turned against me. The, the soap opera was canceled, but we started a TV show and I was working in the TV station, but because I was in training and the contract we signed was for the soap opera and not for the show, I was in training, so I didn't receive any payment. <laughs> so I was forced to work like an adult to have an adult relationship and to do everything as an adult that I didn't want to do for free. So they would exploit you as a worker. You're being raped repeatedly by this 40 year old man that you have no desire to be with. The same with wow. other 40 victims. So, so it's like he had a harem of young teenage girls that he used for sex and they used to be workers on this TV show. On the show, on the records, on the concerts, on the house, on the cleaning, on the accounting, on the driving, on the everything. How many of you were rescued and how old were you when you were rescued? I was rescued at the age of 17 in the year 2000. I already had a baby. Uh, wow. Yes, I had a baby. Of, he was six months old when we were rescued. And uh, we were in Brazil. And we were, I think, around 15 young ladies and teenagers. Were there others that had babies at that point? Yes. Too? At some point, they just decided to, to 
pull up babies everywhere. These people have friends and family in positions of power, in, in, in government, in police, and everything. Intentionally making the, the victim pregnant so she cannot leave because if she leaves, she's never going to see the baby. And regardless of the fact that the baby is the son of the worst person you never want to see in your life is your baby. So we have this instinct that we don't want to leave our baby in that hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that when you're rescuing human traffic victims, you're not only rescuing them, but you're rescuing the babies yes. that have been born. And That's so talk about that process of being rescued and finding healing and how did uh rosie come into your story i moved to cancun that is a little it was back then a very little beach destination were full of people from everywhere trying to hide from my traffickers hide from the media and that gave me a lot of time to think to pass, I was super angry, super angry. I really hated these people. And then they were back on TV singing, for, like nothing happened after they destroyed so many young, innocent lives and our families and everything. So I really was mad. I said, I have a baby, I can't do this anymore. And I don't know how I'm going to make it. I have to get back on track. And I was honest to God. I said, you put me through this. You take me out of this and you raise my children, period. I don't care how you do it. You just do it because you know I'm not going to be able to do it. So little by little, things started to change. And I was in the church, but my heart was not fully transformed until probably 2010 that I went to a spiritual retreat of my church and literally everything came out. I was like immersed in, in, in forgiveness, in peace, in, in, because even if I would say I forgive them because, you know, it's a good thing for mm -hmm. forgive people, you see them and you want to kill them or you're, everything is burning and you're like, yes, I forgive you, but please don't show me, don't, don't appear in front of me because I'm going to remember that I am not mm -hmm. so okay with And, and by, by that time, things started to change. My kids were growing. Mm -hmm. And when my kids were old enough and I, and God gave me the opportunity to send Milton to, to university in Spain, actually. At that time, Rosie came into my life. I, I'm, I was going to her church and my sister was going to her church and everything was like, I know who she is and I know the cause and the trafficking. I mean, you somehow understand, but when I met her, like, like really got together, I really started to understand what's human trafficking. She invited mm -hmm. me to DC to, um, it was about 2017, when I went to uh, my first anti-trafficking Congress in, in the Capitol actually. And I cried the entire event. I cried and cried and cried. So she was super worried and sent me to, to therapy, but, what actually happened is that I realized how it works. That is a system. That is not that they fooled me because I'm stupid or my parents were stupid. I mean, it's a system and everything looks like you're doing the right thing. So yes, we could be smarter. That's why we want to talk about it. We want to say, if you see that, if people fool you, if people trick you, Talk to your parents, talk to your church, talk to your authorities, just say something. Because what cannot happen and the the base, the the like what is supporting day to day all these criminals is our silence. Is that right. we don't say anything, that we remain quiet mm -hmm. because of shame or because of social critics or 
disgrace to the family or whatever reason you want to do it. Crimes like this and abuses like this in the families, in the churches, in the politics, in the schools are happening day to day. Why? Why do we want to keep quiet and protect the predators instead of protecting the victims? If somebody said something, when I was four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This wouldn't happen to me. But we need to talk about it. And thanks to Rosie mm -hmm. to understanding what mm -hmm. was it. Then I started to, to talk about it in a different way with more awareness and talk yeah. about it in different, in different scenarios. And that, my dear Sue, uh -huh. I was a survivor because God saved me. But because God gave me that position of knowledge and power I'm not a survivor I am a cause God gave me a reason for mm -hmm. for my story and now mm -hmm. I use it for good and now it doesn't mm -hmm. hurt me because now I it's something that can help people and that actually is bringing light in if it helps one person then my story was worth it. We have a shelter in Cancun and a, girls are arriving and it's amazing that I say, mm -hmm. welcome, we're going to take care of you. And I've been, I've been in your position at your age. I know what you mm -hmm. went through. And we have girls with babies. We, had a, we, have a, we received a 16 years old girl with her one year old baby. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, nobody is judging because you know exactly what they've been through and they feel mm -hmm. that. I mean, even if we don't talk about our stories, they know, mm -hmm. we know, we know. And that is, I mean, that is something. And, and that's something, it's a precious gift from God. Maybe they don't know it, but if you don't feel isolated and the only horrible thing in the world it's actually a good thing because it doesn't break your heart and your spirit in so many different ways. Carola, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to write this book. Thank you for being healed so that God can use you as a healer. And thank you for making a difference in, in the world today and putting an end to sexual trafficking. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Sue. And just to finish this amazing conversation, I mean, we can do so much with only love and, and caring about others, but we have to change our attitudes if we want to stop this pandemic crime of the modern day slavery and change from defense to offense. We need to stand up. We need to learn about it. And we need to actually take actions. Okay. Start helping, start supporting, start talking. Because this hopefully can happen to any of our beloveds or any, not under our watch, period. Let's believe God and stand together, not on our watch. Let human trafficking come to an end.